Well, hopefully you have a Bible. If you do, please take it and you can turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. We've been spending time over the last several weeks looking at uh, the various verses in this, and we're in chapter 4, continuing our study this morning. Some of you might keep tabs on the investment world, and you might have heard, if you do, that the stock price per share for both Amazon, a company you're probably familiar with, as well as the parent company of Google, which is called Alphabet, both of their stock prices went over $1,000 last week. So that means if you purchase just one share of their stock, or one share of the company ownership of that stock, you would be, it would cost you a little over $1,000. Now that might sound pretty steep as you think about just investment-wise, but actually the company that is, I think, that has the record for the highest per share price of their company is a company run by Warren Buffett. It's called, uh, it's kind of hard to see that there at the top, sorry about that, it's called Berkshire Hathaway. And the class A shares of this company are currently selling, at least the last time I looked, for $249,380. So it'll set you back just almost a quarter of a million dollars, class A shares, to own a piece, just one piece of that stock, which asks or begs the question, why in the world would anybody pay that much money for just one share of stock for that company? Well, they do it because of the financial results that that company has produced over the years. Think about this. If you'd invested $1,000 back, I mean, if only, right, in 1964, $1,000 at $19 per share, you would have, would have purchased a little over 52, uh, 52 shares with that money. Today, that would be worth over $13 million. Just a tidy return on your investment there, huh? But compounded, as you think about that stock, their stock compounded over the years that it's been in existence, their rate of return is a little over 20%, which is pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, the, uh, I think the, the normal stock, the New York Stock Exchange or the S&P is roughly between 10 and 12%, so almost double that. And the reality, though, is that Warren Buffett, as you see that gentleman there, and his business partner, Charlie Munger, they are going to eventually die. Uh, Warren Buffett will turn 87 at the end of August, and so leadership will, ha will change uh, at, the, at the top of the company, and, and eventually the returns that they are getting will probably diminish. I mean, you think about it, even the most, the most quote-unquote guaranteed investment that you can make would be in some form of government bonds or something backed by the U.S. government, and potentially in the next 50 years, our government could even default. So you just never know, right? The issue of, of guaranteed growth really in, in, uh, in life really doesn't exist apart from what we're gonna be looking at this morning here in, in the passage in Mark chapter four. Because unlike every other company or country or investment, only God guarantees that his kingdom's expansion will never be slowed or duplicated. So, you know, you think about all the way, people, I think I just saw... Um, I think Friday I heard somebody somebody uh, put a bid in. You can you can uh, bid to try to have lunch with Warren Buffett, and I think and the money goes to charity. I think this this year it went just shy of three million dollars to have lunch with Warren Buffett. And you're like, whoa, why, why in the world would you pay that much money? Well, he's the Wizard of, of Omaha, they call him, uh, right? He's the Oracle of Omaha. He's the, the one who is, has produced these results that people want to pick his brain and figure out how he did this so that they can duplicate it. The problem is. It can't be duplicated. I mean, you think about, um, you know, people try, and certainly they do for a while, but the only, the only kingdom that produces guaranteed results is the Lord's. And so, you know, we, we, we look at others to try to duplicate what they're doing, but, but God says, no, follow me. Follow me and be a part of my kingdom. And so the, the, one of the questions I want us to be thinking about this morning is to consider the role that God wants you and he wants me to fulfill in this kingdom. As we think about it expanding and growing, what role does he want you to play? What role does he want you to be fulfilled? First and foremost, asking the question, are you a citizen of his kingdom? And that happens as we repent of our sin and place our faith and trust in Christ alone as our savior. But secondly, asking the question as well, how, how well am I receiving and treating the instruction that God provides? I mean, think about some people in March when Berkshire Hathaway has their annual stockholders meeting, it's packed. People tune in on the internet to find out, okay, what's the latest, the latest tidbit that I can get from Warren Buffett? Do we treat the scripture in the same way? So we think about, Lord, give me your instruction. I need your instruction. And so that is going to then have an impact on the way that we live and think about how we as kingdom citizens, if you know Christ as your savior, how that should then affect the way that you 
the choices you make on a daily basis. So let's consider these verses. Look, uh, if you have a Bible, turn over to the, our passage in Mark chapter 4. It's going to be starting in verse 21, and we're going to f- uh, follow through verse 34. If you don't have a Bible, I have the passage on the screen that I'll read through. I would ask that you join me in standing as we, as we honor God, the reading of God's word this morning, at least the first reading of it. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 21. And Jesus was saying to them, so he's going to, now he's already read in uh, chapter 4, we've seen a first set of parables, or one parable, Now we're going to start, uh, starting in verse 21, we're going to see three more. So he first, this is the first one, he was saying to them, a lamp is not, bo- is not brought to be under, to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on, to put, to be put on the lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 24, and he was saying to them, take care of what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. Verse 26, so this is the next parable. And he was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? How does this happen? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. Verse 29. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Verse 30. And he said, here's the third one. He said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are, up, that are upon the soil, Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. So there's the three parables. He finishes then, 33 and 34. With many such parables, Jesus, he, was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. So having read that, let's pause now and just pray and ask God to help us as we jump into this passage. Oh Lord, we have spent time already considering the lyrics of the songs we've sung. We're thankful, Lord, for those songwriters who have put on to paper lyrics that help fan our emotions for you, Lord, fan our desire for you through, through music. We're so grateful for that medium that, that helps to engage our emotions as, long as, as well as our minds in worship of you. And so we pray now as we pause and now transition to a different form of study, we ask that you would prepare us, Lord, to hear from you. Lord, these three parables that Jesus spoke, he didn't speak them just just for the sake of speaking, Lord, you had a purpose. And so I desire, my desire, I pray, would reflect the desire of each of us here this morning that we would have ears to hear. Lord, to be desiring your instruction, to, to hunger to know you more. Lord, that the words that we sang weren't just out of an, empty, an emptiness in our hearts of, of just coming and conforming to what others are doing around us, but Lord, that, that that would be a reflection of our heart's desire to know and walk and love you. So work in us, Lord. Help us to consider the part that we play in your kingdom as we learn more about it because we are ignorant apart from you. Instruct us, Lord, we pray. Give us a heart that's hungry for you. In your name, amen. You may be seated. As I said, as I read through this, there are really three parables that Jesus now prepares for us or is telling now in order to introduce more information about the kingdom of God. At the beginning of chapter four, if you weren't here with us, we looked at the parable that he starts this chapter with the details or deals with these four different soils that represent the four main heart conditions upon which the gospel seed falls as it's broadcast. So last week we looked at the, the hard soil to begin with, and this is soil that falls along the road, an area where it's been trampled down because of people walking on it, and so that ground is, is very hard. The, seeds fall, the seed of the gospel falls on it, and so this represents people who have really no spiritual interest. They're the ones who who drive by the church, maybe on a daily basis, and they barely notice that the church even exists here on this corner. Maybe they're at a funeral, a church service, or talking to a friend, 
And when spiritual truth is shared, Jesus tells us here that Satan comes and takes that seed away through inattention, ill will, or ignorance. Those are various ways that we see Satan operating in the hearts of those who have a soil. Their, their heart, spiritual heart condition is hardened. The next one we looked at was the rocky soil. And here the seed of the gospel falls upon a heart that is initially marked by great excitement about the gospel and, and even shows great interest. But once any form of adversity or hardship comes, specifically because of Jesus and his words, then Jesus tells us that they fall away. Satan is again at work in, this, in the heart of this individual by keeping their soil shallow, by battering their lives with hard times that make the effort required to continue seeking after God sound ridiculous in comparison to the world's solutions for dealing with life. So it's just not worth it. The third soil we looked at was the thorny soil. So when persecution doesn't work, then Satan will try and bring per, uh, prosperity to choke out the work of the word in the lives of those who, who have heard the truth of the gospel and are showing some sparks of, sparks of interest. I like what Pastor John Piper writes. He says this, uh, about this thorny soil. He says, Satan takes away the word by making us feel that if we hold fast to the word, we will have to give up something better. He is the great deceiver. And in America, he majors not on soil two, but on soil three. He doesn't snatch the word as much as by the threat of per persecution as by the deceptive promise that things will go, much, will go better if we don't get fanatical about the word of God. And so thousands of people who have had a start with the word of God give in to his lies and have the word choked out of their lives. So all three of these soils represent people who, not, they don't represent people who had salvation and then lost it. Rather, Jesus' point, I think, here is that he is representing these three types of soils as being people who never had salvation to begin with. Only those pictured by soil number four are the real deal. And the reason why we know that to be the case is because they are the only ones who are bearing fruit. As you look at Mark chapter 4, verse 20, and those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil, and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. So notice the focus on what they do. They accept the word of God, different from all the others. And so we, we, as we sit here this morning, we want our hearts to be of the same condition as the soil that's been marked, that's been worked rather by the farmer. And it's free of rocks and weeds. I was driving back from a funeral just a few weeks ago and I saw, I mean, there's a huge pile of rocks along this, this uh, field. And so undoubtedly out of years, after years of plowing that field, they accumulated all these rocks. And so as I think about it, as our hearts, as we are continually through the, word, the work of the word and the spirit, our, our hearts are, are, God is taking those rocks, those weeds out of our lives. And so our, our hearts are moist as we think about the, uh, the fields around us that, uh, that are moist from the rains and have been nourished by the fertilizer that, that the farmers put down in order to be prepared to receive the seed. And so too, I trust that our hearts are in that way as well. And how does that happen? What do you think about, you know, what, what do you devote your time to on Saturday night or on Sunday morning to get ready to hear from God as you come, before you come? Maybe it's the choice of not staying up late on Saturday night, uh, instead preparing yourself to come by getting enough rest. So when I look out on you, you're not, right? Don't believe the lie that, you, that, that what you're thinking of doing at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. on Saturday night is more important than what, you're, what you'll be doing here at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. So put reading God's word as you start your Sunday as a priority so that you're reading maybe in a psalm or reading in the reading plan that we have prepared in order that your heart might be, might be in, a, in a right frame of mind. You know, maybe you're, you're looking to God's word first before you check Facebook or get on the internet. You're doing the hard work of focusing your minds while you're here as well on the lyrics of the songs that we're singing, focusing on the prayers that are being prayed and on the words of the passages that we're looking at. You're going hard after. You're fighting the temptation to just coast on Sunday mornings and, and just kind of sit here and soak instead of actively engaging with the text, setting your mind to be open to what the Word of God says. And so our prayer is this, Lord, make me fruitful as a citizen of your kingdom. And the part of, you know, coming on Sunday morning is just part of that. 
we obviously want you to be feeding yourselves during the week. And that feeding takes place on the word of God. And so as we, we looked at the four soils last week, this morning we are looking now as we transition to Mark chapter 4, verse 21 and following, we're looking at these next three parables and the expectation is that the soil of our hearts has been receptive to the seed that has already fallen in the past, that's been planted, and with that planting, that there's fruit being produced in your life, and we need more instruction from God about the nature of God's kingdom so that we might obey what he is calling us to do. All of us are ignorant apart, uh, apart from God's word of how he wants his citizens to be living. And so we turn to his word this morning. So look at me at verse 21 as we think about these three important aspects about the kingdom. Verse 21, he uses this analogy of a lamp or the image of a lamp as a metaphor. Verse 21, he was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it, or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on a lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. So during this time, physical lamps would have been on the minds of those who were listening to this, and those would have been used primarily in the evening to provide light. That was their primary source of light. But I believe, based on what uh, Mark writes, and as Jesus spoke this, that, that Mark also, or Jesus, is using this image to point those who have ears to hear to himself. And I say that because of the way this reads literally in the Greek. It's this. In the Greek, it would be this. The lamp does not come to be put under a basket, does it? And there is that definite article there combined with this, this verb to come. I mean, you don't think of, I don't think we see these lamps walking across the stage, right? I mean, they don't kind of walk off the sanctuary and spend time in the storage room during the week and then they make their way out here onto the stage, right? They don't do that. So I think the way that Jesus is describing this, he is doing it in order that we might understand he is pointing, using this lamp to point really to himself, and says so he is saying this, the lamp does not come, in other words, I have not come to be put under a basket, or my message, the reason for I came, this, this good news that I'm bringing, has not been brought in order that you might just hide it under a basket or under a bed. We see that, I think, confirmed for us in verse 22, because he says, for nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. So Jesus here is the lamp of God who has come to bring light and revelation about the kingdom of God. And so the light of Jesus is meant, he is saying, to be shown and not hidden. In the kingdom of this world, secrets are made to remain secret. Why? Because most often they're destructive when they come to light. Right? Or, or, or at least we see difficulty happen when secrets are brought to the light. But in God's kingdom... What was initially hidden will ultimately be revealed because the truth is what sets people free. It's like presents we buy for birthdays and Christmas, right? I, don't, I wouldn't buy a gift for, for uh, George and just keep it in my closet for the next 50 years, right? I, I don't do, we don't do that. Why? Well, because presents are made. They, they're initially kept in secret, but they're, the whole purpose behind why we buy them is that we might give them to, to George or others that you know and, and so that they might open it and be excited for what you have given them as an expression of your love. In the same way here as we see Jesus now has come, but, but what was hidden previously wasn't meant to be continually or always hidden. No, the whole purpose in God's kingdom is that the, is what was secret might be brought to light. And so Jesus now is describing this in his kingdom. The light that he has brought is not meant to be hidden, but rather to be shown. So one conclusion is this. So if you hide it, you misuse it. So if you, miss, if you hide this revelation about Jesus, the light, the lamp, then you misuse it. And so that begs the question, well, how are we tempted to hide the truth about Jesus? Like most clearly, we hide that by not engaging others in spiritual conversations about Jesus. Because somebody had to take the risk to open their mouth to talk to you about it. Right? And somebody didn't hide it. They didn't misuse it when they talked to you about it. But sadly, oftentimes, in our, in our selfishness, we're content in going through our day focused on just completing our to-do list or just discussing the trivial items of the day with our coworkers or our neighbors or our friends. I was thinking about this this week as I spoke with a gentleman 
who's telling me about his dad, who's 95. He has COPD. He lives with his do- one of uh, my friend's uh, sister. So the, the father lives with uh, his daughter. He was a World War II veteran, was a prisoner of war for two years. Very interesting. I'd love to talk to him. But he doesn't really want people to be around him because of his struggle with breathing. Now, he's Catholic, so my friend said that he prays the rosary a lot because like, what do you do if you're by yourself all the time? And, but I, but I, did, wasn't, I didn't have the opportunity to transition that conversation into more spiritual things just because of the time and, and I had to leave. But just thinking, okay, if I were to engage my friend again the next time about this and bring up his father, how might I transition? Because his dad at 95 with COPD is probably close to death. I mean, my friend even said that. And so my, my end was maybe just to be thinking about, you know, as, as his father is getting close to death, to be thinking about, well, what do you think would happen to you? You know, what? And just to see where that goes. To begin to, to think about spiritual things so that I'm not hiding the light of Jesus. Because my friend is in his 70s. I trust he'll continue to live for a while, quite a long, much longer, but just thinking through, okay, how are, we, how are we seeking to engage others in conversation? I was also encouraged as I was talking to another gentleman this week who shared with me that a relative of his was in uh, the Ravenscroft Beauty College. I said, you might have heard that there was an active shooter there. Um, and he told me after hearing the news that he began thinking about how he might minister to his family if things turned out for the worst. I think this is an application of this as well, of, of thinking about the light of Jesus It's meant to be shown and not hidden, especially in times of tragedy and especially in times of difficulty because where do we find our hope? We find our hope in the Lord. So the light of Jesus is meant to be shown. It's meant to be read and applied to the situations of life that we experience. So we're called not to misuse it by hiding it. In verse 23, Jesus says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And I think he says that because all of us are tempted to hide it and thus misuse it. But he continues on in verse 24. Verse 23, we should pay attention to how we're hearing. As we think of verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Be careful, give attention. Right, like those people who want to hear, they pay three million bucks to have lunch with Warren Buffett. How are we paying attention to the instruction that God has provided for us? Verse 24, as Jesus continues, he was saying to them, take care what you listen to, but your standard of measure will be measured to you and more will be given to you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. So take note of what Jesus is saying here. He is saying, be careful how you receive the light of Jesus that he sheds upon us through his word. And the phrase, by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, I think means this. How you value the light that Jesus shines forth, how you receive it, how you value that, will then be turned around and will be used to determine how much light you're given. Jesus clarifies what he means in verse 25. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. Why will the person who already has been given light from Jesus be given more? Well, because he or she values what they have been already received, therefore they seek after more and more is given to them by Jesus. This is contrasted with the person who has had the light of Jesus fall upon them, but they have no interest in getting more. Right, look at verse 25. And whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. I think here's what Jesus is saying. So if you hide it, you risk losing it. So pay attention to how you're hearing. Is the word of God something you see as a treasure? Is it something you take in each day because it's a necessity for you to fight the fight of faith? And what does it mean that, that you will lose it? Well, I think it's, I think it's this idea that, that as you're living life and you are becoming callous to the word of God, then you're, you're really, your Bible is going to be sitting on the shelf. And the risk is maybe you don't know Christ as your Savior after all. Not that you've lost your salvation, but, but again, those four soils, maybe your you're, you're soil's two and three. And that's why he's saying, pay attention to how you're listening. Verse 23, how, how well are you hearing what he's saying? Is there, is there a desire to say, Lord, I want more? 
And if there is, Jesus is saying, that, that then is going to allow you, Jesus is more than happy to give you more. And I think what he's saying isn't necessarily that he's going to give you more scripture. Obviously, the scripture's here, but I think it's the idea of, of understanding, of, of hungering as you're hunger for more. He's going to give and shed more light on, ah, oh, I never saw that application to that truth. As you're reading, maybe a familiar passage. The revelation of God is meant to be shown, not hidden, right? And so, so as we think about, as we're taking in more, would you not naturally then be so excited as you're experiencing the, the work of the Spirit through his word in your own life to then share that with other people? And then the light of, of Jesus is shown forth. The light is meant to, to be accumulated and applied, not cast aside and take it for granted. The lamp of Jesus' light is meant to be added to as we interact with the word which gives light to our paths allowing us to navigate uncharted waters. The reality is we all are entering new phases of life because we're all getting older. I've never been 45 and 274 days. I don't know if that's true, but anyway, you know, that idea, right? Today's the only day I'm gonna be, live that. We're all entering new phases of life and so the reality is as we leave the arrogance of youth, we move into the middle life years where disillusionment happens oftentimes and then you transition into the older age where disappointment and deterioration takes place. We all need the word of God to help us deal with the next progression of life. And so here Jesus is saying, Take in my word. I'm the light, and I've come. Don't hide me under a basket. Don't, don't put me under the bed. Don't put my word on the, on the, on the shelf where it's going to collect dust. Instead, receive it and use it and apply it that I might get the glory. And so the kingdom of God's values and purposes are renewed as we find ourselves daily led by the light of Jesus' word. That's what this first parable is describing. As we continue in verse 26, we see this next parable, verse 26, and he was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. Now this should sound familiar because verses one through 20 has the same imagery, right? You have a farmer casting out soil, like last week where I was casting out candy, right? right? So as we're seeing this, oh, I've been down this road. Well, there's a different emphasis on this one. The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil and he goes to bed at night and gets up by day and the seed sprouts and grows. How in the world does that do that? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself from the blade, the head, the mature grain. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So I want you to see, second point here is, as we think about this aspect of God's kingdom, we need to see first that the kingdom is guided by the light of Jesus' word. Second, we need to see that the kingdom of God and its growth is powered by God himself. He's the one who produces this growth. And he uses, in explaining this, he uses this agricultural illustration. But here the focus switches to the process of growth that happens in the fields that surround us. Right, if you drove south of our church on a, on a homestead road, you would come across fields. If you drove west on Liberty Mills Road, you would come across fields that are filled with wheat and beans. I think maybe they planted beans, but definitely corn. And because of the increase in temperatures and the amount of rain that we've had, coupled with the, the sun that's been able to shine over the last few weeks, you're going to see these tiny little shoots coming up. We were at my parents last weekend, and sure enough, they had some corn stalks, tiny corn stalks in their field behind their house. How does that happen? What well, happens because the farmer plowed the field and planted the seed and, and, and some are praying for rain or a reduction of it, right? Because for a while there we had too much. Coupled with these warmer temperatures and the sunshine, what happens? Well, up comes this shoot from the ground. And we think, well, we can explain it. I mean, chemically we can describe that process that happens, but, but really the power behind that we can't explain. Right, if I laid a seed on this carpet or right here, the seed itself would not germinate and produce the plant. It's only when it's in the soil do we see that happening. And so, verse 28, the soil produces crops by itself. Right, as that seed is put into the ground. And so ultimately, this growth is a mystery. You can't describe it. That's what really what Jesus is saying here in the first part of this parable. This growth in agriculture, agriculture is a mystery, 
But the growth is also a certainty. If, you, if all these things come together, these factors come together, a, a shoot will come up out of the ground. In the same way, Jesus is saying, verse 28, the soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. And he's using this to remind us of the principle with the kingdom of God. It is the power of God that produces the growth. And the growth of God's kingdom is a sure thing. Jesus said so. If you think about Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, this, oops, sorry, Matthew 16, 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Right? The church is being built because it's built through the power of God. But there is a part that we play as followers of Jesus. Look at verse 29. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle, this is the farmer, because the harvest has come. This growth utilizes harvesters. So the kingdom of God expands as God's people share the gospel with others and lead them to Jesus by God's grace as they place their faith and trust in Christ alone. And we see this, this harvest being brought in one soul at a time as the kingdom expands because we're not born into the kingdom of God when, when we come into this world on day one we must be born again by the power of God by the power of the Holy Spirit as he convicts us of sin as we see our need of Christ that, that substitute the one who would bear the wrath that our sins deserve and we trust that he actually that it's true that he would be our substitute that, that we could place our faith and trust in him But we mustn't forget that God uses us as we put the sickle to the field by shining the light of the gospel and calling people to repent and believe. And what a joy to be able to be participants in that. So that's one application, but I think longer term is the idea of this, this final harvest where, where God will separate the, the crop from the weeds, right? There's, there's that final judgment that comes in relationship to how people have treated the light of Jesus? And that is a sobering thought. And that's part of the reason why we are proclaiming the message of Christ, that others might come to know him as we have by his grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as we think about just application of this, as the kingdom of God's growth is powered by God himself, Maybe there is the step of, of confessing the sin of doubt because it feels like the kingdom in your world isn't growing very fast. You know, you, maybe you've been spending time sharing the gospel with people. And frankly, it's just discouraging. Because it feels like the, the, the seeds uh, that you're broadcasting, that you're casting, are falling on hard ground. We need to be reminded of this truth that the kingdom of God's growth is powered by God himself. He certainly calls us to pray and, and maybe that would be an area where you can continue to, to just say, Lord, help me to pray more regularly for the people around me. That, that I would, and maybe even confessing your apathy and engaging or caring about other spiritual condition. Maybe you're, sadly, you're content with just coming on Sunday and kind of eating a meal together with your other brothers and sisters and then you go out during the week and it's just focused on doing your job or fulfilling the roles that God has called you to do. But you're not really burdened for the people around you. And so God would be calling you to say, Lord, I, I repent of that. I, I, Lord, give me a greater, a greater passion, a greater heart of love for the people around me because you sent someone who had a love for you to me and those people around me need, need me to do that as well. Jesus continues then with the final parable as we reflect upon our own hearts in verse 30. It says, and he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God or by what parable shall we present it? And this is where he introduces the mustard seed. And the focus here of this last one, we saw the first, the kingdom of God is guided by the light of Jesus' word. Secondly, it's powered by God himself. Finally, the kingdom of God starts small but expands exponentially. And again, he, uses, he utilizes a physical example. 
that's well known, would have been well known, the mustard seed in order to illustrate this important spiritual truth. The mustard seed is used because it, it was for the uh, Hebrew mind, or Hebrews and Greeks at that time would have been the smallest seed known to them. We know it's not the smallest seed in the world, but it would have been for them at that time. So this small seed, Jesus says, when it's sown in the soil, it grows by the power of God into a large plant whose branches are able to allow the birds to find shade and to nest in it. So what's he saying here? Well, I think he's saying that like the mustard seed, the kingdom would have a very inconspicuous beginning. It's interesting that it takes 20,000 mustard seeds to equal one ounce. 20,000. That's a pretty small seed. And so it began with Jesus. You think about the, the, the ministry that Jesus had as he left the earth. It be, he began with just a handful of followers who saw him ascend back into heaven. And so like the mustard seed, the kingdom produced, here's an example of a mustard seed. Maybe you can see this picture, this gentleman here standing. I don't know how long it took, but mustard seeds can grow and produce. That's a, approximately a 10 foot tall. He had another picture where he measured it. It was 10 feet tall. They can, they can grow in size up to 10 to 12 feet. And so this mustard shrub, really it's a shrub. It's the largest among the herbs that a farmer could plant in his garden. And it produces things like this. Now, it's not a tree. Obviously, you kind of picture in your mind this huge, you know, big tree. Well, it's a shrub, but it's still it's huge. We see these same amazing results take place in the book of Revelation as we think about the, the expansion of God's kingdom. Revelation 5, 9, and 10, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. There are people from all over the globe who are part of this kingdom. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God and they will reign upon the earth. There are people from all over the world who are part of this kingdom. It's not just a, uh, a Hebrew kingdom. It's not just a Greek kingdom. It is not just an American kingdom. It is worldwide. And so here Jesus is reminding us of this truth of, of how amazing it is to think of just a small number of followers in AD 33 that now has developed into this worldwide group of people who are following after Christ. And what did they do with the instruction that they received? They didn't hide it, they proclaimed it. And we are the direct results of that. And so we have to ask ourselves, we need to be reminded that the work of evangelism is, it's the important work, that the investment is worth the effort because there is a guaranteed result. Thinking about last uh, year, I mentioned uh, the, the effort that we made in the summer at our, well, our family did called Sundays, the ice cream Sundays on Sunday the day, and inviting our neighbors to come over just as a means of engaging them in conversation. So to think about, you know, it's, that's such a trivial thing. But am I trusting based on this principle that out of that small mustard seed that I'm, that I'm seeking to engage with my neighbors, hopefully this summer as well, a period of times, that God's gonna produce something great from that in the lives of the people who respond. I can't go pick them up and make them come. And last year in the four times we did it, we didn't have the same people. Oh, except when one family came more, twice. But everybody else was a different set of people of the 29 homes that are around our house. But it's funny, one of the kids just two weeks ago said he was over swinging on her swings. Hey, when are you guys gonna have that ice cream thing? Right? So at least one person's looking forward to it. So you think about, okay, Lord, I'm trusting that the efforts that I'm making today are gonna bear fruit because your kingdom, I know, expands exponentially. And in my neighborhood, I, I, as I walk around and just seek to pray for my neighbors, I'm praying, believing that God can do that. That what he's saying here is true. And so that's gonna lead to life change for me. It'd be much easier just to, you know, kick back on a Sunday night and not have people over. But I wanna do what God is saying here, right? I'm not gonna hide the light of Jesus under, under my bed. Right? I, I, wanna, I want that to be shown, and so that means that I have to take steps to do that, and that means you too have to take steps to say, Lord, how might we, you be leading us to take some steps in obedience to what you want me to do? Because you don't know what God's doing in the hearts of the people around you until you engage with them in conversation. 
Jesus finished then the last part of this, verse 33, and with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it, right? This, the, the people who are uh, attuned to, right? The, uh, remember the analogy I gave uh, about the translator, the conversation at my house says Spanish. I'm listening, but I'm not understanding, right? Those who are, who are hearing, they're, they're listening. Are we listening to the parables that Jesus has spoken? And he's explaining to them privately, we're reminded here, I think this, like parables, the kingdom of God requires careful, careful examination and explanation. The reality is we can't just approach God's words flippantly. We need help from others to help us understand it. Sometimes it is hard and difficult to understand. Even Peter said that as he read the writings of Paul, inspired by the same spirit. So we stand on the shoulders of those before. Sometimes we use commentary. Sometimes we use others around us to help us to understand what it is that Jesus is saying because we want to know him. We want to walk with him. We want to make known the light of the gospel. And so that's why we have other classes, why we have smaller groups to help one another live life together as kingdom citizens. To understand parables and to understand instruction in the epistles, to understand the Old Testament, to understand the Gospels. And so we need you. If you're a teacher, to be teaching. If we need you at various aspects of the body to be utilizing your giftedness to help others. Right? If, if your body isn't functioning right, then you feel it. I, I'm in physical therapy now from my shoulder to my hip. Right, that, that's transitioning in phases, right? As we get older, right, my great-grandfather are getting older and it's for sissies, right? So we're seeking to recognize that all parts of the body need to be functioning in order for all of us to grow and change and live as kings and the kingdom citizens that we should. So as we close this morning, just thinking about these guaranteed results, what part are you playing as the kingdom of God expands? In your bulletin, you should have a response card. And just thinking about some specific questions to consider or statements to consider as we close this morning. On the front of this card, it should have one in your bulletin. On the front of it has an opportunity for you, for you to put your name and address for us to send you a gift of thanks if you are a first-time visitor. On the back of it, it has these statements. Pray for me as I examine how I might be mishandling the light of Christ as I use it to guide my own way and also share it with others on a daily basis. Or just realistically asking yourself, how, how might I be misusing it? Secondly, pray for me as I purpose each week to be praying, investing, and inviting others to live under the reign of God's kingdom through faith in its King, Jesus Christ. Right, we're making known this and we're doing it through the power of the Spirit as we reflect upon what we've seen here. The kingdom of God is powered by God himself. And trusting that, that he is working, even though it feels like, well, you're not working very fast, Lord. Or fighting the temptation to not do what you, what you know God is laying on your heart. Finally, please contact me as I see that just like understanding Jesus' parables takes careful examination and explanation, I need help understanding what Christianity is and how someone becomes a citizen of his kingdom. Maybe you're here this morning, and this is just reflecting your, your, your attitude. You know, you might have a cursory understanding of Christianity, but really, you don't fully understand what it teaches and how you can know forgiveness for your sin. So if that's where you are, just check that last circle and drop it in the offering plate, and I'll get back to you to help you understand from God's word how you can know that, how you can know Christ as your Savior and answer that question. So thankful for the time to spend in Mark chapter four. I trust that you've been encouraged I'm going to pray, then we'll have a final song, and you can, uh, we'll take our offering as another means of worship. Let's pray together as we finish.